Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship with us this morning at New Dublin Presbyterian Church. We are delighted that you are worshiping at home with us this morning. And we hope that it will be meaningful to you, that you will find the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. I have several announcements for you. The first is, uh, if you recall from last week as well, we have begun online giving. This is a great opportunity to give in a way that is easier um, than mailing a check might be or even really just remembering to bring something with you on Sunday morning. It's easy to set up. You can set it up to recur at certain times if you want to, every week or every month. Uh, And it's a benefit for us as well in that we have more of an idea what we're working with budget-wise month to month. If online giving is not your thing, budget or giving envelopes are available. They're out here uh, on the side table, available for you to come by and pick up. There's very rarely many people in the church in the morning or at any time really, so feel free Uh, You probably won't encounter anybody if you're worried about COVID. You can come in, grab it, go out, um, and you will not see anybody. So these are on the the side table. I'd also like to invite you to write a letter, or two letters, to our two students that we sponsor in Guatemala through Pura Vida. We have this opportunity to write letters to these students we sponsor twice a year. We have an opportunity to send them financial support. The limit for that is $50. Uh, You can find more information for how to do that, where to send it, uh, at our website or through the email that gets sent if you're on the prayer chain or the the church emails. That will be uh, there as well and in the announcements. So you can find that information uh, online. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the Almighty God. Good morning. I'm Jim Cook. This is my wife, Gail. We'll be reading from the Living Bible, the third chapter of Mark. While in Capernaum, Jesus went over to the synagogue again and noticed a man there with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. Would he heal the man's hand? If he did, they planned to arrest him. Jesus asked the man to come and stand in front of the congregation. Then turning to his enemies, he asked, Is it all right to do kind deeds on Sabbath days? Or is this a day for doing harm? Is it a day to save lives or to destroy them? But they wouldn't answer him. Looking around at them angrily, for he was deeply disturbed by their indifference to human need, he said to the man, Reach out your hand. He did, and instantly his hand was healed. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the Herodians to discuss plans for killing Jesus. Meanwhile, Jesus and his disciples withdrew to the beach, followed by a huge crowd from all over Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Adamia. From beyond the Jordan River, and even from as far away as Tyre and Sidon, For the news of his miracles had spread far and wide, and vast numbers came to see him for themselves. He instructed his disciples to bring around a boat and to have it standing ready to rescue him in case he was crowded off the beach. For there had been many healings that day, and as a result, great numbers of sick people were crowding around him, trying to touch him. And whenever those possessed by demons caught sight of him, they would fall down before him, shrieking, You are the Son of God. But he strictly warned them not to make him known. Afterwards, he went up unto the hills and summoned certain ones he chose, inviting them to come and join him there, and they did. Then he selected 12 of them to be his regular companions and to go out and preach and to cast out demons. These are the names of the 12 he chose. Simon, He renamed him Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, but Jesus called them sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, 
James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, a member of a political party advocating violent overthrow of the Roman government, and Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. When he returned to the house where he was staying, the crowds began to gather again, and soon it was so full of visitors that he couldn't even find time to eat. When his friends heard what was happening, they came to try to take him home with them. He's out of his mind, they said. But the Jewish teachers of religion who had arrived from Jerusalem said, his trouble is that he's possessed by Satan, king of demons. That's why demons obey him. Jesus summoned these men and asked them, using proverbs they all understood, how can Satan cast out Satan? A kingdom divided against itself will collapse. A home filled with strife and division destroys itself. And if Satan is fighting against himself, how can he accomplish anything? He would never survive. Satan must be bound before his demons are cast out, just as a strong man must be tied up before his house can be ransacked and his property robbed. I solemnly declare that any sin of man can be forgiven, even blasphemy against me. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven. It is an eternal sin. He told them this because they were saying he did his miracles by Satan's power instead of acknowledging it was by the Holy Spirit's power. Now his mother and brothers arrived at the crowded house where he was teaching, and they sent word for him to come out and talk with them. Your mother and brothers are outside and want to see you, he was told. He replied, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Looking at those around him, he said, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, may our thoughts and our prayers and our words this morning be honoring to you. May they be true. And may they lead us more and more into your presence. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. There's an idea floating around in our cultural ether that Whatever you might think of Christians, we can all at least agree about Jesus. You hear Gandhi quoted a lot in support of this theory. You know, the one where he says that he likes Jesus, he just doesn't like the people who follow Jesus. And if we're being honest, there's a fair amount of reason why people would be distrustful of Christians. We can cite everything from the Crusades to the debacle of the Capitol a couple weeks ago, and a whole lot in between. Christians are highly imperfect by any standard. But you know, what we learn in the third chapter of Mark is that we can't all agree about Jesus either. If we were going to give this chapter a title, we might call it The Battle Lines Are Drawn. In each story that makes up this chapter, we see people make judgments about Jesus. Some people decide to follow him. Some people want to kill him. Some people just think he's crazy. They certainly don't agree, for instance, that he's a good teacher who can make us, you know, give us a better way to live. That option doesn't seem to be on the table. And I wonder what the difference is. What makes someone a follower of Jesus as opposed to an enemy who wants to kill him or a mocker who just thinks he's crazy and needs to go home? Well, you might think that Jesus could make it all very clear by himself if he wanted to. If he give us some evidence. If he'd do one of the miracles that we read about in scripture right here in front of us. Prove he is who he says he is. One good, clear healing. One solid resurrection of the dead. Surely that would settle any doubts we might have. Whether 
Christ still works these kinds of miracles is a matter of some debate. But if he did, wouldn't it dispel all our doubt? There are people who think so. But the Bible doesn't seem too optimistic on that point. Jesus, it tells us, entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and found a man who had something wrong with his hand worshiping there. It's withered. I'm not really sure what that means. Something's wrong with it. It's been that way for a long time. It's not life-threatening. It's not an emergency. It could have waited 24 hours till after the Sabbath is over. But Jesus chooses not to wait. He chooses to heal the man right there and then. And so technically he breaks the Sabbath in order to improve someone's life. We talked about that a little bit last week, that God's laws aren't intended to harm us or constrain us, but to heal us and set us free. But you know, what's interesting about it for this week is that the Pharisees, who if you remember are kind of um, hyper careful, often lay, what we would call lay people, and Herodians, who would have been political supporters of the local puppet king, they're not impressed. They're not convinced. They're more worried that the law of the Sabbath has been broken than anything else. And they leave the synagogue and go off into some corner to conspire to kill Jesus. We learn a little bit more about these leaders' objections, religious and civic leaders' objections, a little further down. Mark does this a lot, you'll notice, if you read it along with me, or, or just for yourself. He takes these stories and he sandwiches them uh, in between each other. So in this case, we go from religious leaders' enmity towards Jesus, to demons, to calling disciples, back to religious leaders, back to demons, back to disciples. So keep an eye out for that in your own reading. But if you skip down, uh, these leaders, we have scribes thrown in now, are still really hung up on the Sabbath thing. And the conclusion that they've come to is that if Jesus is willing to break God's law to heal on the Sabbath, he can't be sent from God. Because why would somebody who's really from God break God's laws? So it's not the power of God that he uses to cast out demons. He must be using the power of demons to cast out demons to trick them. Jesus has two responses to this. First, he points out that it's just really bad strategy on the part of the forces of evil. It's like killing your own troops. You don't do that if you want to win the war. And it is a war, right? They don't need to do it because right now, you know, they're the strong man in control of their house. They don't need to make that kind of sacrifice. The second uh, criticism cuts a little bit deeper. The accusation that Jesus is using the power of evil to cast out demons instead of the power of God, that accusation is a sin against the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says there's no forgiveness for the sin against the Holy Spirit. That's serious. It causes a lot of anxiety for a lot of people, understandably. It caused me an enormous amount of anxiety when I came across this at, you know, 14 or 15 years old. But the thing to know is that it's not a sin that you just commit accidentally one day and wake up and think, what have I done? It's a state of being. It's when you're so used to sin, so corrupted by evil, when the whole subject of vice and virtue, good and evil, become a matter of theory or a matter of politics that you get to argue about that don't have any real impact. When it comes to the point that you can't tell the difference between good and evil, between God and demons... That's when you've come to a state where you can't repent, 
Because, of course, as far as you're concerned, there's nothing to repent of. There's no sin. There's no evil. There's no good. It's all the same thing. One sign, according to the scripture, that you're headed that way is when you can't see anymore that Jesus is motivated by good. When you can't see that a man regaining use of his hand is a good thing. That healing is no sin, even if it's done on the Sabbath. Witnessing Jesus' grace and power in someone else's life, as inspiring as it might be to someone who already follows Jesus, isn't enough to convince the unconvinced to follow Jesus. At least, it isn't always enough. There's always a reason to doubt. Always a reason to be cynical and look for the smoke and mirrors. Miracles don't always make disciples. Sometimes they just make enemies. Because if you're cynical enough, anything can be turned into evidence of evil. I think cynicism is probably the most dangerous enemy that faces us today. It's, it's fashionable and popular. It keeps you from getting hurt. But it does that by inviting us to put a barrier between ourselves and the reality of good and evil and right and wrong. We can go into cynicism easily enough. But at some point, at some point we might not be able to come back out of it again. So healing miracles aren't enough. What else might make a disciple? Sometimes we're tempted to think that knowing things makes you a disciple. Knowledge. I will tell you outright, this is a temptation that I am prone to fall into. The more you know about the Bible, the more you know about Jesus. If you can recite the creed and explicate the Trinity, well, that makes you holy, right? That makes you a disciple of Jesus. You must be to learn all those things. Maybe we can just study ourselves into righteousness, study ourselves into following Jesus. If we know the truth about Jesus and about God, if we know lots of trivia about the Bible, if we know it really well, then we're a disciple, right? In verses 7 to 12, We hear that Jesus and the disciples traveled around the local area teaching and healing. He casts out a lot of unclean spirits, a lot of demons. And when he does, interestingly, they fall down before him and shout out, You are the Son of God! The demons know exactly who Jesus is. Does that make a demon a disciple? Of course not. So this is a warning to those of us who like to think we know a lot about the Bible, a lot about theology, a lot about Jesus. Knowing doesn't make a a disciple. Knowing might just make us a demon. Knowing things, of course, is good. Studying the Bible is good. Learning about who Jesus is is good. It can be powerful helps for our devotion, but it By itself, it isn't enough. By itself, knowledge isn't going to make us into a Jesus follower. Maybe, though, you fall into the opposite account. Far from feeling like you know enough to be a good disciple, you feel like you don't know very much about the Bible at all. You don't know anything about theology, even though you love God and you try to do what he tells you to do. If that's you... Take this passage as a comfort. Lack of knowledge can be worked on, but it's not the most important thing. Notice the strange thing that Jesus does, faced by these falling down, confessing demons. He's done it before, but we haven't really paid attention to it yet. And he'll do it over and over again in the coming weeks. He commands them to be quiet. Don't make him known. It's not the time for perfect head knowledge yet, especially when it comes from demons. He wants to build the relationship of love and trust with his people first. Knowledge will come later. It will come. 
that will come later. We see one more temptation in this chapter. It's the temptation to think that we have special access to Jesus because we live in a community of good Christians or because we come from a family that's devout or because we are a pillar of our local church. That's, I suppose, what Jesus' family must have thought. He was out there doing fairly well, but a little bit embarrassing. People thought he might have been a little crazy. They, uh, we're going we're gonna to use our family authority to come and take him home and sit him down and bring him back to his senses. But when people come in to tell Jesus, your mom and your siblings are calling for you, they want you, Jesus It might seem a little cold, but Jesus rejects the whole idea. Who are my mother and my brother and my sisters? Not the people who are related to me by blood, but the people who do the will of God. Formal or informal relationships, accidents of our birth, happening to be born into a Christian society or a Christian family, These aren't enough to make us Jesus' family, not enough to make us Jesus' disciples. It's about hearing when he calls, doing as he teaches. We're a little allergic to that in the Presbyterian Church. The Reformation slogan, saved by faith and not by works, is baked into our DNA. And it's true, we are saved by faith, not by works. But when we've heard the call of Jesus on our lives. When we're really transformed by the Spirit, our lives will change. If you have a cold, you cough. The cough isn't the cold, but it comes out of the cold. If you've heard the call of Jesus, you will begin to do the will of God. You won't be perfect, not in this life, but you'll start the journey. You'll start the change. You'll start to be a disciple. Jesus calls you by grace enables you to answer by grace, and that grace will change your life. That life of listening to Jesus' call, responding in faith, growing in grace, it's a lot harder than reading a bunch of books. It's a lot less glamorous than seeking out miracles. It's less gratifying than feeling like you have a special claim on Jesus because of your history or your family or your culture. But those things, even if they are easier, even if they're more satisfying in the short term, they won't get you to Jesus. They might get you to moralism or legalism or self-righteousness. They might make you so blind that you can't see the difference any longer between good and evil. But wherever it gets you, it won't get you to Jesus. It won't get you to the will of God. And the will of God, as we can't say too many times, is to get you into the heart of love so that you become like a mirror that reflects and participates in God's glory and love and perfect joy. There's only one way to get there, and Jesus knows the way. Jesus is the way. So let's trust him. Let's follow him. And to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly, abundantly, than all we could ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. This morning we are delighted to install part of our class of elders for 2024, Roxy Reed and Jim Jim Atway. It's uh, one of the great joys of our church's life to, to install, sometimes to ordain, but this year just to install our new elders who will lead and guide our church for the coming three years. And I hope that you keep Jim and Roxy in your prayers. 
There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given the gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the church, some are called to particular service as elders and as ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, for the governance of the church, and for preaching of the word and administering the sacraments. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the session of New Dublin Presbyterian Church installs Jim and Roxy to active service on the session. Do you, Jim and Roxy, trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, I do. I do. Okay. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal, and God's word to you? If so, I do. I do. I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith, as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, I do and I will. I do and I will. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, I will. I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, I will. I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, I will. I will. I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, I do. I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, I will. I will. Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and in discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, I will. I will. Now I will ask you at home some questions, and I encourage you to answer them, even if you feel silly or if you're the only one there. Do we, the members of the church, accept Jim and Roxy as elders, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation, to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ, we do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? We do. Let's pray. Gracious God, Pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, that we may be for you a holy people, baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain this congregation and ministry. Ground us in the gospel. Secure our hope in Christ. Strengthen our service to the outcast and increase our love for one another. 
Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together, that we may be servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Jim and Roxy, you are elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. And hear this charge from the book of 1 Peter. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for your service. Thank you. I invite you into a time of prayer with me for our world and our country and our church. Let's pray. Lord our God, we praise you for creating the world, for creating humans in your own likeness, and calling out from every people in every time and place a special church to be your witnesses in the world through whom you spread your light. We pray for the church in places where it suffers. We all suffer, I think, Lord, from not meeting regularly due to the coronavirus. But some places suffer worse than others through the hostility of their government or their neighbors. We pray that you give them hope and perseverance and favor in the eyes of their governments, that the blood of the martyrs would be the seed of the church. And we pray for the church in places where it is only too easy to be your followers, that you would save us from complacency and keep us awake to watch with Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, for all the countries of the world that where there is sickness, you would bring healing. Where there is injustice, you would bring justice and the love of truth. That where there is war or the rumor of war, you would bring a just and honorable peace. We pray for our own country, for Joe, our president, and for our governor, whose name I have forgotten, but which you, O oh Lord, know well, Ralph, for Ralph, our governor, for all who make and enforce our laws, that their governance would be done for your glory and for the good of their people, rather than for their own selfish gain. We pray that the political climate, which has pitted family members against each other and friends against friends, that you would bring us peace, that you would bring us reconciliation, that your truth would shine forth. And Lord, we pray for those who are dearest to us, who we name before you now in silence. Lord, if they are sick, grant them your healing. If they are dying, grant them your peace. If they are lonely, grant them your presence. 
We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go in peace, have courage, love and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with you now and forever. Amen.